Welcome to the broadcast of the Bethel United Reformed Church. You can visit us online at jenisonbethel.org. Or you can join us each Sunday on the corner of 20th and Baldwin in Jenison. Our service times are 9.30 a.m. and 5.20 p.m. If you'd like a copy of this message, you can download it and many more by going to sermonaudio.com and searching for Bethel Jenison. Or you can re-watch this service and others by going to YouTube and searching for Bethel Jenison. As we now turn our attention to the worship of God, may the Lord richly bless you, that you may know the comfort and the peace of belonging our to the, in the Lord. Name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, receive God's greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Turn with me in your Bethel Sings. We're going to turn to our Bethel Sings this morning to hymn number 100. Angels, we have heard on high. We enter into that season where, where it's, a, it's a good thing to start singing these uh, great Christmas hymns once again. So angels, we have heard on high. All the stanzas of hymn number 100. breath in our lungs, but more important than the physical blessings, to know, O oh Lord, that you have physically redeemed and saved us by sending us the incarnate word to speak your truth to us, to conquer the unbelief of our heart, to remove from us the blindness of our eyes, and to remove from us the slowness of our hearts. You have caused us to see the light of truth. 
You have allowed us to find your grace. You have allowed us, O oh God, to be rescued and ransomed to the perfect atoning sacrifice of your Son. Lord, at this time of the year, we think of family. We think of our loved ones. We think of our, our spouses. We think of our, our moms and our dads. We think of we think of our children. We are called to love all people. We are called to love our neighbor as ourself. But we see that unique bond and that unique love that we have in the communion and the fellowship and the close knitness of a family. And to think, O oh Lord, that the union that you have and the communion that you celebrate in the persons of the Trinity from all eternity past to all eternity present far exceeds the, the joy and the fellowship that we have even in the context of our closest relationships. And yet, Father, you saw fit to send your only begotten Son whom you love to atone for our sins that we might be washed as white as snow. You have said to us in the gospel that that was not too high a price to pay to gather us in. That you might seek the lost sheep and possess the lost coin and purchase the price of the lost son. Father, we with adoration, praise, and thanksgiving bring before you our worship then. Our song, our prayer, our physical gifts for the building up of your kingdom, for the general fund, and for the educating of our, our covenant youth. Lord, we give to you our life as an offering of thanksgiving and praise for the magnitude of the gift that you gave us. You have given us the length of days. All around us we see death and we see decay. We see destruction. But you have promised to lengthen our days as you call us to yourself and give to us eternal life, eternal days with you. And so, Lord, receive our worship and our praise. May it be that we, in fact, kneel down before you, if not physically, in our hearts, with humility, recognizing what it costs to bring us into this building, let alone into your love. That with humility, we would thank you and bless you. With humility, we would cry out to you. We pray, Lord, that you will bless our congregational meeting tomorrow night, especially in the midst of uh, the mistake that uh, we made. And, and Father, we pray that you will bless this meeting and provide for us the direction that we need as a congregation as we go into a new year, as we need new leadership, as we look for a new budget, and as we deal with the day-to-day the, the -day business and the operation of our, of our congregation. Give to us peaceable spirits. Give to us, O oh Lord, the kind, of, uh, the kind of attitude that is going to need to be had if we are going to continue to build on the promises of your word. So thank you for Bethel. Thank you for all that you're doing in and among us. And Lord, would you receive the praise alone. Father, we pray that you will be with us as we go into this, this day. Uh, we pray that you will be with our brother, uh, Mr. Knott, as he brings your word to us this evening. We pray, Father, that you will continue to bless him in his training and his education. And as he brings a word of edification to us tonight, we pray, Lord, that you will go with him and support him and strengthen him for his task. And bless us all, Lord, together as a congregation, that as we receive your word this day, you would have your way with us, molding us and shaping us and causing us to see 
the beauty of the Christ who has come and is coming again. Give to us the focus that we need, the attentiveness of our minds. Give to us stillness in our households. Help our sons and our daughters to invest in what we are doing, to recognize that we are called to be active participants in the worship of you, Almighty God, and that in all of this, in the work and the labor that we do right now, that you would bless our homes and bless this congregation for generations to come. So, Lord, receive our thanksgiving and our praise and hear us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hymn 335, hymn number 335 is the hymn that we turn to as we prepare to hear from God's word this morning. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. Let us uh, rise to sing the first three stanzas of 335. We conclude with singing the Amen. Thank you, Rita, by the way, for doing that. I forget how beautiful it is to hear God's people singing a cappella. What a beautiful thing that is to be able to hear. What we're going to be looking at this morning is really um, uh, providentially what, uh, what we just sang about in the opening line, and I didn't even realize that uh, the opening line of Come Thou Long Expected Jesus would fit in quite the way that uh, I think it now does fit in. Let us find our rest in Thee. From our fears and sins, release us. Let us find our rest in thee. That, in the nutshell, is what we're going to be looking at this morning with God's help, finding our rest in the Lord. And we're going to be beginning a sermon series, our annual Advent sermon series, from the book of Genesis of all places. We're never very often in the book of Genesis, so I thought, why not go to the book of Genesis? If you're visiting with us, we've been in the book of Genesis for quite a while. And uh, so I thought uh, to go through the account of Noah. And this may seem like a very strange place to turn. I would probably agree with you. It is a bit of a strange place to turn for an Advent series. And so I want to spend the first part of the sermon this morning developing a kind of apology, a kind of defense for why I want to study this with you and trust that it's not simply a defense of why we want to study this, but indeed be blessed in the four reasons that I want to put before you just in the opening introductory comments as to why we're going to be studying this and how we're to be benefited from a study of this. So Genesis chapter 6, if you haven't found it yet, it's 
It's uh, pretty easy to find. It's on page 7 in our Pew Bibles. And I want to limit our reading this morning to just that first pericope, that first uh, section of the first eight verses. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those who were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Only evil all the time. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast creeping thing, and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let's pray. Bless us now, Father, with understanding and insight. And help us to see, Father, how as we come to this section of your word, how it uh, strengthens us and prepares us to receive the coming Christ. That, Father, we would recognize that we are not simply reenacting something that took place 2,000 years ago, but we are, in fact, awaiting the coming of the Christ, the second advent. That's the season that we're living in living with longing desire. So we're not reenacting the the first Christmas. We're looking for the coming of Christ again. And so, Lord, we do pray that you will then bless us as we come to the study of your word in Genesis. And as you have allowed us to study it in the past and set the context then already for what we want to look at now, that you will bless us and that you will help us to see you and the goodness of the gospel that you have brought to us. It is in Jesus Christ that we pray, and for his sake. Amen. Four reasons I want to begin with as uh, our introduction, and I will say already that, uh, uh, just by a word of warning, uh, if you will, that uh, the the four reasons that I'm going to go through are maybe a little bit uh, long, uh, but I want to be clear as as we introduce this annual Advent series, I want to be clear as to why uh, we're studying uh, this section. So let's just dig right in. Reason number one, if you're taking notes, four reasons. Reason number one as to why we come to Genesis 6 and the study of the account of, of Noah. Reason number one, we need to free ourselves from thinking that the only time we can study the effects of Christmas, the gift of Christmas, is during Christmas. And the only time that we can ever truly um, study a Christmas account is by going to one of the Gospels. So we need to free ourselves from understanding that the celebration of Christmas is for a certain season and, and, and for a certain scripture passage. It's not. We are to celebrate the gift of what Christ has given to us all the time because the pages of Scripture, particularly beginning in the Old Testament, are all leading up to one moment. The whole Old Testament is leading us to the birth of Christ, the cross of Christ, the empty tomb of Christ, the ascension of Christ. And the New Testament, if I can be a bit oversimplistic, the New Testament is preparing us for the second coming of Christ. 
The old covenant is building us to the first coming. The new covenant is showing us that he is coming again. And if we do not realize that, if we do not appreciate that, we will never see the rich beauty of what it is that we are called to celebrate during the season of Christmas. In order to celebrate something richly, you need to understand it deeply. When I began working with wood as a, as a hobby, as a, as a woodworker, someone once told me that you should always be very mindful of the fact that the medium with which you are working, wood, a seed had to be dropped in a forest, a tree had to be birthed in the forest, and a tree had to grow for some 80, 90 years. It had to be cut down. It had to be dried. It had to be given to you. And now you have to go through all of the work and follow a plan and follow a design just so that you can have a piece of furniture that you call a table. So it's not as though it just arrived in a showroom. There's a history that goes back to a seed that was planted a long, long time before you were even born. Sometimes we approach Christmas celebration like we look at a piece of furniture in the showroom. It's just there. But God gave to us a rich history of redemption. He has shown us the seed that is planted from generation to generation to generation to generation so that we would see that for millennia he was working about bringing the birth of the promised child. And until we see that deeply, we will not appreciate richly what we celebrate on December 25. And Noah shows us, the Noahic account, Genesis 6 shows us already. Genesis 6, we're only six chapters in, God's faithfulness to preserving the seed that would grow and be cut down to live again, to make us the church. The master craftsman building his church. So reason number one, we need to free ourselves from limiting our understanding of the Christmas holiday for just the Christmas season. Got to get rid of the awkwardness of singing joy to the world in July. It just doesn't feel right. I agree, it doesn't feel right. We need to recognize the rich, rich gift we have. Reason number two, the account of Noah leaves us right where we need to be left. In a sense, right where we are now. John Piper says of the account of Noah, the story of Noah cries out for an epilogue. The story of Noah cries out for an epilogue. In other words, it cries out for an ending. It cries out for a conclusion. It cries out for a finality. This needs to end. It's not over. It's not done. So even after the earth is renewed, even after the earth is destroyed with the flood, there is still sin in the world. And so, like, there has to be something more than this because the world is still as equally worthy of judgment, i.e. Tower of Babel, as they were during the days of the flood. There has to be something more than this, right? You read these stories, and they have these endings, and you're like, that's no ending at all. I don't like that ending. They should have written a better ending because nothing's solved. The, the loose ends aren't tied up. Have you ever realized that those those are some of the best endings in the world? Why? Because you realize that the author is going to come along again with another story. And he's going to finish it. It leaves you longing to be satisfied. The Noahic account leaves us where we should be right now. Because like I said in our, our, our prayer, it's not as though we are trying to reenact something. So we come to Christmas time and and, and we we don costumes and and we pretend like we're living 2,000 years ago and we have all these kinds of pageant plays and everything else. We're not trying to recreate something. We're trying to realize where we live right now. They long for the coming of Messiah. When is the seed of the woman going to be born? Well, now we know the name of the seed of the woman. His name is Jesus. But the same longing is still here in this heart. I hope in your hearts. 
I want the epilogue. I want the end. I want the conclusion. And already in Genesis 6, we see the Lord building as the great author of the great gospel story. He's building that anticipation. And the great author of the great story is still building that anticipation within our hearts. Reason number three, the story of Noah allows us the opportunity to explode the phrase, the reason for the season. Jesus is the reason for the season. Amen, agree, good phrase. I'm not in any way bashing on the phrase. As a matter of fact, I'm completely copying that phrase for every single sermon we're going to be looking at that I put in your bulletins just so you have some idea, some sense of where we're going in this study. But the phrase needs to be unpacked. Because the word Jesus, though only five letters in length, only comes to be seen in its beauty, in its benefit, when it's exploded. In other words, when it's expanded. Most of you probably have airbags in your cars. And, and, and the airbag only is really a benefit to you, not as it just stays there all compacted and, and squeezed into this little package, but, but the benefit is when it expands. The word Jesus needs to be expanded. It means he shall save his people from their sins. And so it's not just Jesus is the reason for the season. I agree, but someone please unpack this. Sin is the reason for the season. Transgression is the reason for the season. Preservation is the reason for the season. Propitiation is the reason for the season. Restoration is the reason for the season. Adoration is the reason for the season. It's not there are all kinds of reasons. No, it's all contained in that one word, Jesus. And we need to explode this and expand this. And as we come to the account of Noah, it provides us a perfect opportunity to explode that familiar phrase. And then finally, reason number four. In light of what I just said, we need to remove and, uh, and extract from this holiday a, a, a a kind of unhealthy sentimentalism. That it's, I love this time of the year. You do? Why? Oh, I love the poinsettias are out now and some nice greenery and, and mulled cider. You don't normally drink mulled cider in, in, in July. And Christmas songs we get to hear on the radio. I, I'm all about sentimentality. Um, I'm not against sentimentality, but but we need to extract from our celebration at the end of the day an unhealthy sentimentality. The season's reason is celebratory because of a very sobering truth. I needed a child to be born, a son of Adam to be born, because only shed blood. And yes, that's a gruesome, barbaric phrase. Don't get used to that phrase. It's kind of a churchy phrase. Only the barbaric shedding of blood. Life for life. Can atone for our sins. The son of glory had to face hell's horror. Which doesn't mean we cannot laugh. It doesn't mean we don't smile during the, the holiday season. Don't be merry. Far from it. We are invited to be merry in this time of the year. But our merriment needs to be rooted in the right place. Our merriment is rooted in redemption. Redemption. Our celebration is that the seed of the woman was lifted from the debauchery and the violence of Genesis 6 and carried on an ark. 
and they all lived happily ever after. Tell the story again. I love the story. No, that's not. It's not the end of the story. And they all lived happily ever after. He was lifted. The seed of the woman was lifted from the debauchery and the violence of Genesis 6 and brought into the debauchery and the violence of the Roman Empire. The debauchery and the violence was not yet to be experienced, Genesis 6. The time has not yet come. In December 25, we celebrate that in the fullness of time, God says, no, the time has come to be born into violence. To be born into sin. And to be sin. He was protected, Genesis 6, so that he might absorb in Matthew the horrors of our sin. That's the story to which we say, it's hard, but tell it again. Because that's what we celebrate. That God's holy fury against our unholy rebellion was absorbed. That's what we see as we come to Genesis 6. It's not all happy, happy, happy. It's, It's only evil all the time. So, is there a reason for our rejoicing? Absolutely. But it's not just because of the greenery that, and I'm not being critical of the greenery or the poinsettias or any, but it's, it's not that. We like that, but it's not that. It's that God 2,000 years ago said, it is time to break the chains of sin. It is time to cover shame. It is time to satisfy justice. It is a celebration that is so deep, so profound, and so utterly joyful. The angels say, rejoice! Because he has come to save his people from their sins. That's what the party is. We've been saved from our sins. So maybe Genesis 6 seems like an odd place to turn, not the most Christmassy of passages, but but maybe we need to better understand what Christmassy really even means. A Savior has come. So a long introduction, and uh, I have two long points, at least in words, um, and that's what I want to look at in the time that we have left. And and the two points are, are these. As we come to Genesis 6, the first eight verses, we see an inescapable pattern maintained. And that pattern that we see maintained is the multiplication of nothingness. See, it's a long point, I know. But an inescapable pattern maintained the multiplication of nothingness. And second of all, an inescapable pattern broken the magnificence of graciousness. So first of all, an inescapable pattern maintained the multiplication of nothingness. Um, we have to really look at the first seven verses from about 10,000 feet, I think, to, to get the, the, the point and, and the flavor of, of what is going on. As we look at the passage from, as I say, about 10,000 feet, we see that there are two actors that are, that are, that are interacting, if you will. And, and in the first seven verses, the, the, the people that are interacting are the sons of God and the Lord, Yahweh. We see already, we saw already in the opening chapters of Genesis that the Lord had introduced him as the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. And uh, Moses keeps with this theme by continuing to use the covenant name of the Lord. Unfortunately, uh, we're thrown off by other language and we don't always appreciate what's going, going on here. And so we come to the text and it talks about the sons of God were having sensual intercourse with the daughters of of man. We go, what's going on here? This doesn't sound right. And, 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 and from this, people have conjectured that, that what was taking place was you, you had angels in incarnate form taking on physical form and shape and, and having sexual relations with the, the daughters of men. So you have the sons of God, angels, interacting with the daughters of men, 
us, people. And then from that, you have this unique offspring that the text mentions. We have giants on the face of the earth. Um, I don't know that that's the most helpful understanding of this passage, nor the most faithful. Whether it's helpful or not, the question is, is it faithful? I don't believe that that's a faithful understanding of what's going on in this passage. Not least of all, because we don't know of angels who are spirits taking on physical form and then acting in this kind of way. Nowhere else do we see this or angels interacting in this kind of way. Rather, we're safer to recognize that the Lord is making a distinction here in this passage between the sons of God and the daughters of men. And that's a distinction because we've studied the opening chapters of Genesis that we recognize, we we understand the distinction. The distinction came in chapter 4. The distinction is between Cain and Abel. The distinction is between the church and the world. Those that are in covenant with God and hence the sons of God. And those that are sons and daughters of Adam, the offspring of Cain. And so the better way of understanding this passage is not some kind of speculative, it's angels that have come in physical form and they're interacting with the daughters of men. What is being said here is that you have intermarriage that's going on. Those that are in the line of Seth are saying, why do we have to be so distinct from our cousins over here, the Canaanites? Let's just all get along. Let's blur the line of distinction between the covenant community and the community of unbelief. Let's let's just blur the line of distinction. Let's get rid of it all together. And so they did what they wanted to do. That's the emphasis of the text. We'll marry who we want to marry, and we're going to be like our cousins because they married as many wives as they wanted to marry. And so we're going to be like our cousins, and we're going to do whatever it is that we want to do. The point, though, is that we see a pattern in the text. We see here a pattern of man rebelling. The sons of God, the emphasis is on the sons of God. Of course it is, because they're in a covenant relationship, undefined at this point, not fully matured and developed, but they have a relationship with God at this point. They're doing what they want to do. The church is doing whatever it is that they want to do. We don't have to obey God. Rebellion followed by response. So verse 2, we see the rebellion. Verse 1 tells us that that they're multiplying all over the place. Verse 2 says, here's the rebellion. Verse 3 says, here's the response. And this is the pattern that we begin to see developing in the first seven verses. Man rebels, God responds. And so God's response is what? He says, I'm going to limit the days that they walk on the earth. So they're going to experience something they haven't experienced before. The flood has not yet taken uh, place. Uh, Men lived longer during this time than they do now. And God says, I'm going to limit their days. In other words, I'm going to limit the effects of their rebellion by limiting the amount of days they can walk on the face of the earth. But then we come to verse 4, and what do we see? If you look at the text, the pattern's repeated. Here we go again. It's the same pattern that we just saw. Man rebels, God responds, and it's a response, it's a warning. But instead of man saying, ooh, wait a second, maybe we should live with the antithesis as God called us to live, man says, no, we're going to, in fact, double down, and we're going to intensify our rebellious ways against God. And so things heat up. And so instead of it simply being a rebellion in the context of mixed marriages, we read, in light of what God saw, that they did only evil all the time. What was maybe, in a sense, contained to just uh, their, their, their marriage relationships has now completely sprouted out, and they do only evil continually. And with that comes an intensified response of God in verses 6 and 7. And God responds by saying, done. I'm done with you. Chapter 1, verse 26, God says, let us make, let us create 
Adam. Six chapters in, verse 7, God says, I will destroy Ha-Adam. I will destroy mankind. I will destroy Adam, whom I have created. What we see here is a pattern that man does not in any way want to escape. He keeps digging in and digging in and doubling down. And that's what makes verse 1 so ironic. Adam continued to multiply. Ha Adam continued to multiply. But it's a multiplication of nothingness. Zero times zero is what, children? Is the, this is the best arithmetic problem you can have. You don't know multiplication. It's zero. Exactly right. Good job. Nothing plus nothing equals nothing. And here you have the generations of men. Nothingness is multiplying with nothingness, except now what do you get? You get the complication of sin. You get the multiplication of cursing and not blessing. So it's not really fair to say nothing plus nothing equals nothing. Nothing plus nothing in our text equals massive amounts of trouble and transgression. Here's the broader point, though. There is this pattern in the text. And I, I would argue that there's, there's more than just a, a pattern in the text. I, that there's a kind of chiastic form, which I know I lost the most of you right now when I, when, I, when I say that, but there's this kind of chiasm in the text. It begins with A, goes to B, you see another B, and then you come back to A. It kind of ends in the reversal of where it began, but very similar. Anyway, be that as it may, this is highly stylized, this section. You go, well, what's the point? Well, the point is Moses is saying, even in the way he wrote this, notice this. Because this isn't just a pattern of literature. This isn't just a pattern of generation. This is the pattern of Ha-Adam. This is the pattern of Adam. This is the inescapable pattern of Adam. It is the multiplication of nothingness. When the Hebrews would listen to this read to them, remember, they are about a half an hour into hearing the entire book of Genesis being read to them, right? It didn't take very long to read up to Genesis chapter 6. And this is what they would have heard read verse 1. Now it came to pass when Ha-Adam, when Adam began to multiply in the face of the earth. Verse 3, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with Ha-Adam forever. He's saying this is the pattern of Adam. That in Genesis 6, we see Romans 6. The wage of sin is death. This is the historic pattern of Adam and all of his descendants. And it brings God to say something that we barely can even scratch the surface on. We can't scratch the surface this morning. But But if we had all time to think about, listen to what God says in the midst of Ha-Adam and the pattern that he's content to live. I am sorry that I made them. What did God just say? He said he's sorry that he made Adam. Mankind. Our sorrows are normally rooted in mistakes that we make. I began this morning's service by saying, I'm sorry, mistake. But our sorrows are not always rooted in sins that we've committed or mistakes that we've made. Our sorrows can also be rooted in deep sorrow or something that we've had to participate in. We did nothing wrong. We wish that we wouldn't have been there. But we had to be there. Or that we see something. We're sorry that we saw it. One commentator, an old Dutch commentator, says this. When we read in Genesis 6 that something pained God in his heart, we must show enough respect for the text to let it stand. Don't explain this one away. Let it stand. He goes on to say, God was deeply disappointed and saddened when he saw what had become of his world. 
He was not indifferent to the events on earth. Rather, the developments caused him great pain, even if it was not the pain of one who has been defeated. A massive indictment. Adam grieves the Lord and gets exactly what he has coming to him. The Lord does not hold back. And yet he says, this whole business grieves me. The first seven verses utter blackness. It's an utter blackness, though, that you can see a hairline crack of electrical current. And that hairline crack lights the night sky. Verse 8 is that electrical crack in the night sky. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. An inescapable pattern broken. The magnificence of graciousness. Seven verses. God says, here's your warning. And man says, thank you, I'm doubling down. Then here's your condemnation. I will destroy you for your sins against my love against my holiness. God shows us, as my old preacher used to say, God is not one to be trifled with. Seven verses, he says, do not mess with my holiness. The Hebrews listen to this passage and they hear the word Adam again and again and again. Adam, 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 Adam. Adam, death, death, death. And then we come to verse 8. From hearing this familiar word, which means mankind, which is also a name, Adam, they hear the name Noah. But Noah. God is the greatest storyteller that there is. Because you're coming to this passage, you're like, Noah's got to mean something, right? It means something. I need to hear something. It does. You know what Noah means? Rest. In the midst of all that's going on, this inescapable, seemingly unbreakable pattern of rebellion and rebellion and rebellion and the multiplication of nothingness, zero times zero equals zero. God says, but I'm going to interject and flash this word in front of you. Not Adam. Not Adam. Noah. And the Hebrews would know what the word Noah means, but rest found grace in the eyes of Yahweh. Rest. You come to this passage and, 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 it's, and it's tiring and it's wearisome and God strikes that bolt of lightning and blinds us. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. A great story, isn't it? Seven verses, it's building, it's building, it's building, it's building. And then just one little verse. There it is. Grace. Here's what you need. Rest. And who receives the glory in this? God. Because after all, Noah is a son of Adam too. He is Adam as well. But God shows him grace. He found grace, it says, in the eyes of the Lord. He didn't earn grace. He didn't deserve grace. He didn't take grace. He didn't make the right decision. And so he shares the spotlight with the God of grace. No, it's all grace. All the grace of God. God gets all the glory. And yet it's right here where we see that we need more. It's already right here that we say that we, we need more than this. This is good. We want to hear the story because it's history. It's our history. But we need more. 
Through Noah, God would bring rest to his people. But verse 8 points us to what we celebrate on December 25. Because we need one who is grace. And not simply someone who passively received grace. We need God's sovereign, full, complete, and all-encompassing epilogue. Noah is a picture of Christ here. We'll we'll see that in, in the days ahead. But in the face of the weariness of sin, we don't need a picture of Christ because the picture of Christ here, Noah, needs Christ. The picture of redemption needs redemption. We need a redeemer who doesn't need to be redeemed. We need one who will cover the sins of Adam's nature, a nature that Noah still bore. We need a savior to come in the face of our transgressions and save us. God chose Noah to be the appointed means of carrying the line of faith. He's shown grace because he says, I'm going to show grace continually to my people. You've received grace because I'm going to show grace. And how is he going to show grace? By shattering the inescapable pattern of Adam. Yes, first of all, in Noah. But the one whose name is rest points to the one who is our rest. That's where the pattern is shattered and broken so that we might be made whole. You don't expect the verse 8 in light of the first seven verses of Genesis 6, but there is a verse 8 that leads to a verse 9. And because there's a verse 9, there's a December 25. And because there's a December 25, there is hope for sinners. Sin is the reason for the season. There is hope for sinners. And that hope is found in that explosive word, Jesus. I pity in one sense our brothers and sisters who live in the southern hemisphere. Because I, at one and the same time, hate the season of the year, but also love the season of the year. I hate it because we're forever cold. I hate it because we see a brown earth. (laughs) It's kind of dead and it's kind of yucky. I kind of hate this time of the year because it's real busy. Very crazy, very busy. And you end up July, July 2, January 2. I just need, I need to rest. But I love this time of the year because this time of the year, the Lord covers the brown earth with white snow. And he says, he says, here is your atonement for sin. And you need to see it. White snow over the brown dead earth. And we're cold and I need a covering. And he says physically, here's the covering. My son. And he says in the midst of the hustle and the bustle and the busyness of our days and our life. Here is Noah. Here is rest. Here's your rest in Jesus Christ. An inescapable pattern that's broken. How? Through the magnificence of his graciousness. Doesn't look like it's very Christmassy, I know. But if that's not Christmas, then maybe someone needs to tell me because I I don't know what it is. I think that's what it is. May God be praised. Let's pray. Father, we thank you as natural born killers, as natural born God despisers, as natural born blasphemers, as we are born with the nature of the first Adam that you have come and give to us, Noah, you have given to us rest. 
We thank you, Father, that in your sovereign will, you saved and redeemed believing Noah and his family. And that you had contained on that ark that we are going to be studying, you had carried on that ark not just little furry animals and little birds and, and animals. You had carried on that ark the seed of the woman that would crush the head of the serpent. You had on that ark him who would save us from our sins. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for showing us that grace and that mercy and securing for us real celebration and giving to us real joy. That we can sing there is real joy because there is real rest, a real covering for the coldness of our hearts, whose name is Jesus Christ. And so bless us in this season of anticipation, not just for December 25, not just for the gifts under the tree, but a season of anticipation that Christ is coming again. And we thank you for that. And so now, Father, send us with your blessing. Send us in your benediction. Even as we pray now, that you would hear our song of praise. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Three hundred thirty-seven. I've. Uh, alluded to it and referenced it. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let's rise to sing the three stanzas, hymn number 337. Receive now the blessing of the Lord as we part. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. Thank you for joining us for another broadcast from the Bethel United Reformed Church. It's our privilege to bring these services to you each week. 
as we seek to help you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about us here at Bethel, we'd love to hear from you and introduce ourselves to you. You can join us for Sunday worship at 9.30 a.m. or 5.20 p.m. Or you can read more about us on our website at jenisonbethel.org. We trust that the Lord has fed you with his word in this day. May you now, therefore, go in his peace until he brings us together again.